Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Going to get into another round of questions tonight. Of course, we study diligently. Make sure you study God's Word every day. And, uh, but um, we, we go deep, try to learn as much as we possibly can, obviously. But never forsake the basics. Never forget our number one job is to bring people to Jesus Christ. And always be compassionate. And of course, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Make sure you share that with others. And if you have not already, make today that you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, come to eternal life. Come to peace of mind that only comes through the Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, call out to the Lord, repent of your sins, and live forever. And so, what a blessing it is. And uh, so, let's go ahead and get into these questions. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name, amen. All right, first question, we have Gary from North Carolina. What is Amos chapter 3, verse 15 talking about? And um, so I'm going to read here verses 14 and 15 of Amos chapter 3. Uh, a great deal of that chapter has to do with um, even cause and effect. It's a fascinating chapter. But this is verse 14 and 15. It says, That in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. Bethel, if you were to translate it, means house of God. Saying all the false churches, they're going to be cut off. And verse 15 says, And I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. And historically, it even had to do with the Assyrian was coming, and the Assyrian took the ten northern tribes captive. And you know who the Assyrian is a type of. And remember, Satan is coming. He wants to destroy souls when he comes as the false Christ. But this is saying you might have a home for the summer and a home for the winter. You might have luxurious palaces, great houses. But that's all going to come to an end when God's wrath comes down on the wicked and um, so that, that's what that is about there. And remember Proverbs chapter 10, verse 2, it says, Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. Richard, we don't know where Richard's from. Was James the disciple whom Jesus loved? And actually it is John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And that's mentioned um, several times in the Gospel of John. We're going to mention them. And uh, part of it, I mean, I think uh, part of the reason that it is worded that way is John was being very humble. He wouldn't even say his own name uh, during those scriptures. But he was saying how he just, he felt the love so much by Jesus Christ. Of course, John is not the only disciple that Jesus loved, but he just felt the love so much. I think that's part of the reason that the Holy Spirit guided it to be worded that way. These are the scriptures that, that says that. John chapter 13, verse 23, where they're um, eating together with Jesus Christ, when he would tell them, one of you is going to betray me. It says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. And then that disciple would ask, who is it? Asking who would be the one to betray Jesus Christ. Then John chapter 9, and it's interesting that every time it says the disciple whom Jesus loved, it's in like very important situations. John chapter 19 verse 26 is when Jesus Christ is actually on the cross, very close to his flesh body dying. And it says, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, 
He saith unto his mother, Behold thy son. And she would go to that disciple's home and he would take care of her. Then verse uh, chapter 20 of the book of John, this is when uh, Mary Magdalene comes to the sepulcher, but Jesus Christ has resurrected. And it says, Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. But of course, that was not what happened. She didn't realize at that moment Jesus Christ resurrected, just like he said would happen. And you see Peter and John together so many times, and especially in the book of Acts, uh, the first several chapters. Then John chapter 21, verse 7, we come to after the resurrection. And uh, this was when they, they were out there fishing, and then uh, Christ, he, he showed up on the shore. And it says, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and cast himself into the sea. Now that does not mean he was literally naked, but he only had like his undergarments on. That he wanted to speak to Christ. Now verse 20 of that same chapter, John chapter 21. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? And we spoke about that already. Now, um, now we're going to read John chapter 21, verses 24 and 25. These are the last two verses of the Gospel of John. It says, and speaking of the disciple whom he loved, as we just saw a couple verses before, it says, This is the disciple which testifies of these things, and wrote these things, showing us that the disciple whom Jesus loved is John, the writer of this Gospel. But of course, it's actually God. It's God's Word. And we knew that his testimony, or we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Can't even begin to imagine all the incredible works that Jesus Christ did while he was in the flesh and after he resurrected and even what he continues to do. <clears throat> Of course, now he's in heaven on the right hand of the Father. Carrie from Missouri. I'd like to know all of the keys of David. I think that I've confused myself about the subject. Is that certain things are just a message about standing against the false Christ? And that, that is part of it. And where do you read about the key of David? Revelation chapter 3 verse 7. This is what it says. It says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true. Of course, this is Jesus Christ. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. And just a couple verses after that, it will mention those who claim to be Jews, but do lie and are the synagogue of Satan. You see the same thing in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. It mentions those same ones, and that's the Kenites. So you see, the key of David, it makes sure you know the difference between the seed line of David, which that's the seed line through which Jesus Christ would be born. You know the difference between that and the false seed line. The Kenites, which claim to be of the seed line of David, but do lie and are the synagogue of Satan. That The key of David is absolutely vital. There, and there are seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Only two of them God had nothing against. It's Philadelphia, that one of Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through about 12, and Smyrna, that of Revelation chapter 2, verses about 8 through 12. Both of those churches mention those who claim to be Jews but do lie and are the synagogue of Satan. You have to know the difference. You see, the Kenites, they slip themselves right in amongst Judah, and they don't want you to know the difference. But that key of David gives you understanding. And as you mentioned about standing against the false Christ, in, the, in those scriptures concerning both of those churches, they do give you wisdom about standing against the false Christ. When you do that, you're going to be delivered. Um, you're going to be cast into prison for 10 days. 
And it says, that's Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, it says, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. And that word keep means to guard. You're protected. And just like then it, uh, that same word is used in John chapter 17, verse 15, where Jesus Christ, he says, he's praying to the Father and he says, I pray not that thou take them out of the world, but that thou keepest them from the evil, that you protect and guard, and God truly will. Then Revelation 3.11 says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Your job is to stand against the false Christ. But if you're deceived and you worship him, then yeah, you lose that crown. Don't let that happen. Also mentioned in uh, Matthew chapter 25, but I will mention praise God for the, uh, the millennium, that thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. But Matthew chapter 25, verses 10 through 12. Remember you have those ten virgins there? Well, at the beginning of, verse, of chapter 25, Matthew, you have the ten virgins. Five of them had enough oil in their lamp. The other five didn't. The other five did not have the truth of God sealed in their mind. And then this is what it says, Matthew chapter 25, verses 10 through 12. It says, And while they went to buy, this is the five virgins that did not have the oil. The, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, those that stood against the false Christ. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But they were just deceived by the false Messiah. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. The door was shut on them. Key of David opens doors no man can shut, and shuts doors no man can open. And we went into a great uh, bit of detail concerning the key of David just a couple weeks ago, and we taught Isaiah chapter 22. That video is number 40.16. It's called The Key of David, The Valley of Vision. And that was our teaching in Isaiah 22. I definitely recommend watching that to get more detail on that. Larry from Texas. What's the difference between someone having a zeal for God and being a religious fanatic? And I think the perfect verses to answer that question is Romans chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. And this is what it says. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. I mean, there's a lot of people, they, they might know a lot of Scripture, might go to church all the time, but if they don't show the compassion of Jesus Christ, then they're not doing the right thing. Yeah, they might, and many times, what will they do? They'll always try to judge other people. They'll talk bad about other people. They'll think they're so righteous, but they're filled with uh, hatred, they, they don't show love to others. They don't show compassion. They don't have peace of mind. So yeah, they have a zeal for God, but not according to righteousness. Uh, John from Colorado. What happens on earth with the seven bowls? And he's speaking about the seven vials of Revelation 16. If all humanity is translated to heaven... What do these judgments pertain to? Well, all humanity is not translated to heaven. Jesus Christ is coming here. The Lord is coming here. And I'm going to read Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. It says, and I would re highly recommend picking it up in Revelation chapter 15 and beginning in verse 1. It's only about eight verses, chapter 15 is. And then going into chapter 16 so you understand the time frame of the vials. But this is Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. It says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God up on the earth. And then go into the first vial. It says how the, um, the vial, that first vial, is poured out on those who have the mark of the beast. And the grievous sore came upon them. So, of course, they're on earth. And... Zechariah chapter 14 will make it abundantly clear to where no one can deny it that 
The Lord is coming here. The kingdom is being set up here on earth. Um, and I would recommend really reading that whole chapter. I'm going to mention two verses from Zechariah chapter 14. Verse 4 says, and this is speaking of the Lord, And His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And then so the Lord will return. And shortly after that, there will, the thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20 will begin. And that's what it's speaking about in verse 17 of Zechariah 14. This is what it says. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Not going to be good for them. But of course the kingdom is going to be here on earth. And yes, when the seventh trumpet sounds, everyone in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, everyone is changed into spiritual bodies. You read about that in the seventh trumpet in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 50 through 52. Also in Revelation chapter 11, about verse 15. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses about 15 through 17. And Mark chapter 13, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, make it abundantly clear. When does that happen? When are we gathered together to Jesus Christ? After the deception of Satan as the false Christ. Your job is to stand against him. Do not be deceived. Richard, we don't know where Richard's from. Mark chapter 13, verse 24, where it says, After that, is that referring to the vials being poured out? Then every knee bows. Hopefully I said it correctly. After that tribulation, the reference I connected it with is Isaiah chapter 13, verse 10. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 13, verses 10 through 13 is what led me to the vials. And when it says after that tribulation, it's speaking about after the tribulation of the false Christ. And of course, as always, go back, find your subject. What's it talking about leading up to that verse? Mark chapter 13, verse 21 says, If they say, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. Then verse 22, For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. And verse 23 says, Behold, I have foretold you all things. And then this is what it says in Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 27. It says, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Make note also of Daniel chapter 7. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. When does that happen? After the tribulation. Now let's read the verses you mentioned in Isaiah. This is Isaiah chapter 13 verses 10 through 13. How fantastic it is when you get these witnesses in the New Testament and the Old Testament. What a tragic mistake it would be to not study the Old Testament. You get so many details there. Isaiah 13, verse 10 through 13 says, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give her their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will, make men more, I will make men more precious than fine gold, a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Well, who's that speaking of? Those who stand against the false Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of, their plate, out of her place, in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, in the day of his fierce anger. So, of course, that happens after the tribulation. God's wrath is going to be poured out. Those vials will be poured out. One more, Larry from Texas. 
I know Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 says, There is one Lord, and Jesus repeats the same to it in the New Testament. And it's true, that verse is quoted in the New Testament by Christ. How is it that in the Psalms it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. And he's speaking of Psalm chapter 110. But I want to read exactly what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And just like you see in John chapter 10, verse 30, what does Jesus Christ say? I and my Father are one. Now, make note of Colossians chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. It says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, through the blood of Jesus Christ, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the, first <clears throat> excuse me, the firstborn of every creature. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Now, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, speaking of Je uh, I'll just read it, speaking of Jesus Christ, of course, uh, it says, who being the brightness of His glory. Jesus Christ is the brightness of the glory of the Father and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The majesty of the Father is so far beyond what we can even begin to comprehend. But God, as the Son, Jesus Christ, is an image that we can see, that we can even try to begin to understand, that we can even try to begin to relate to. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. That's why it says, the Lord our God is one Lord. Because the Father and the Son are one. And so, I know a lot of people try to make that complicated, but, but it's not. It's, it's really not. Jesus Christ and the Father are one. And so, um, I think, I hope I explained that sufficiently, and I didn't explain it. God's Word explained it. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and this place you've given us. We can teach your word. We just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share them with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name, amen. Church in Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.